Section 12 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tricia G. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 3, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 7, Punishment, Chapter 1, The Sentence, Part 1. In the infliction of punishment, the Inquisition differed from secular courts in one important respect. Public law provided for impenitent heresy death by fire and confiscation, and visited on the penitent and on descendants certain disabilities, but apart from these, in its extensive field of jurisdiction over penitent heresy, suspected heresy, and other offenses, the Inquisition had full discretion and was bound by no rules it was the only tribunal known to the civilized world which prescribed penalties and modified them at its will in this as in so much else it combined the legislative and the executive functions the culmination of the work of the tribunal was the sentence which embodied the result of its labors and decided the fate of the accused in all cases that appeared in public autos de fe the sentence was publicly read and the opportunity was not lost of impressing on the minds of the people the lofty duties of the holy office and the enormity of the guilt which merited such chastisement it afforded an occasion for the display of power which was turned to the best account there were two forms of sentence con meritos and sin meritos the former recited at length the misdeeds of the culprit the latter was briefer and merely stated the character of the offence the consulta de fe when it agreed upon a verdict usually defined which form should be used and also whether or not the culprit should appear in a public auto this in itself was a severe infliction aggravated by the reading of a sentence con meritos for lighter cases the sentence was read in an auto particular in the audience chamber of which there were several varieties as will be seen hereafter the sentence con meritos commenced with a full recital of the details of the trial through all the various steps of the cumbrous process represented as a suit between the fiscal and the accused and it specified the crimes proved against or confessed by the culprit it was thus sometimes enormously long in the famous case of magdalena de la cruz a fraudulent beata revelandera whose fictitious sanctity and miracles had deceived all spain throughout a long career the reading of the sentence at cordova may thirteenth fifteen forty six occupied from six in the morning until four in the afternoon in the sentence of don pablo de soto convicted of bigamy at lima in seventeen sixty one all the examinations are detailed at full length including information volunteered by him concerning persons and matters in no way connected with the case the secretary appears to have copied verbatim the records of the successive audiences as though to prolong the shame of the penitent after these prolix recitals there followed the verdict christi nomine invocato in which if the trial had resulted in conviction the inquisitors found that the fiscal had duly proved his charges wherefore they must declare the accused guilty of the heresy alleged, with its corresponding penalties. As a rule, prisoners were left in ignorance of their fate until, on the morning of the auto de fe, they were prepared for it by being arrayed in the insignia which designated their punishments. So jealously were they kept in the dark that, when the customary proclamation was made of an auto, fifteen days in advance, with drum and trumpet, the officials were not allowed to approach the inquisition lest the inmates should hear the sounds and guess what was in preparation at the great auto of lima in sixteen thirty nine we are told that when the proclamation was made the negro assistants of the jailer were shut up in a place where they could not hear it so that they might not carry the information to the prisoners and the workmen employed in making the mitres sanbenitos and crosses were assigned a room in the inquisition where they could labor unseen under an oath of secrecy 
the effect of the sudden revelation when it came is indicated in the advice that it was better to give to those who were to appear their breakfasts in their cells than to wait until they were all brought together for the procession for then there was shame and confusion and suffering the fathers seeing their sons and the daughters their mothers in the sanbenitos and other insignia that designated their punishments the despair induced by the preceding long-drawn suspense occasionally found expression as in the case of diego gonzalez who was reconciled for judaism in the valladolid auto of july twenty five sixteen forty four on the morning of that day when the jailer entered his cell to give him breakfast he was found pale and faint with the blood flowing freely from a wound in his arm made with a nail from his bedstead under the impression that he was to be burnt and he had to be carried to the solemnity in a sedan chair Urente recounts a similar case of which he was an eye-witness in seventeen ninety one when a frenchman named michel maffre de rieu hanged himself in consequence of being thus kept in ignorance the object of the delay in thus communicating the sentence was to prevent appeals to the suprema we have seen how in opposing appeals to rome the inquisition and the monarchs argued that they were wholly superfluous in view of the appellate jurisdiction of the inquisitor-general who was always prompt to rectify injustice committed by the tribunals but this nominal opportunity was rendered for the most part illusory by this device of withholding knowledge of the sentence until appeal was impossible this came about by degrees originally it would seem that the tribunals exercised discretion as to withholding the sentence until the auto although exceptions were rare the instructions of fifteen sixty one while admitting a right of appeal in some cases nullified it by ordering in such cases the tribunals to send the proceedings in advance to the suprema without allowing the accused to know of it there evidently were contending influences of justice on one side and convenience on the other for in fifteen sixty eight it was ordered that in cases not of heresy when the penalty was arbitrary the culprit should be notified in advance of the auto de fe and this was extended in fifteen seventy three by instructions that in cases admitting appeal the party should be notified in time to enable them to do so this concession to justice caused trouble and on april eleventh fifteen seventy seven the tribunals were ordered to report on the evils arising from it apparently the inquisitors reported adversely for on september eighteenth they were ordered to return to the former practice of not notifying culprits prior to the auto de fe there was however quite an extensive class of cases in which the right of appeal was not completely cut off by this these were the more trivial ones in which the sentence was rendered in the audience chamber and in these both parties the culprit and the fiscal were required to assent on the spot when either could appeal for the fiscal had the same right as his opponent it was included in the commission issued to fiscals in the long enumeration of their powers and duties and was a right not infrequently exercised although the culprit thus had an opportunity to appeal he was obliged to act without advice in the case of maria casaya in toledo december nineteenth fifteen thirty four when called upon to assent to her sentence in the audience chamber she asked for delay then in the afternoon she begged to be allowed to consult her husband or her counsel and on this being refused she accepted the sentence still as public autos diminished and private autillos multiplied the opportunity for appeals became more frequent and were sometimes successful this was more apt to benefit ecclesiastics than laymen for except in cases involving degradation they were never exhibited in public autos their sentences were read in the audience chamber and they were more likely than the ordinary culprit to possess the education and intelligence requisite to profit by the opportunity cases of appeal by them are consequently not infrequent fray lucas de allende guardian of the franciscan convent of madrid 
was one of the dupes of Lucretia de Leon, an impostor who pretended in dreams to have converse with God and the saints. He busied himself in writing out her revelations, and was tried at Toledo, where he lay in prison from June 1590 until April 1596. He was sentenced to a reprimand and warning not to meddle with such matters, to accept certain definitions laid down by the tribunal, and to strict reclusion in a convent for a year. He vigorously protested that the sentence was absurd, and he appealed from it, to which the fiscal retorted by likewise interjecting an appeal. The Suprema heard both appeals, and decided, July 30, 1596, by confirming the sentence as to reprimand and warning, and omitting the rest. Even this did not satisfy the obstinate Franciscan, for when read to him, August 2nd, he refused to accept it, and appealed to the Pope, but, on being warned to reflect well, he on the same day withdrew this appeal and submitted. There can be little doubt, however, that the inquisitors suppressed the revocation of part of the sentence, for there follows a petition from him to be allowed to visit his native Via Rubia before entering upon his reclusion, deceit of this kind being perfectly practicable in the profound secrecy of the tribunals. More successful was the Hieronymite Fray Martin de Casares, prosecuted in Valladolid for superstitious curing of the sick, and sentenced in 1655 to reprimand and four years' exile from certain places. The Suprema had confirmed the sentence, and yet on appeal from him it remitted the exile. By this time the Suprema was supervising all action of the tribunals, and, as it gradually became the whole Inquisition, appeals grew to be superfluous, yet the custom of withholding the sentence was persistent. There was one class of cases, however, in which notification of the sentence was always made prior to the auto de fe, those in which the culprit was condemned to relaxation. The object of this was to give him a chance of saving his soul by confession and conversion. In the earlier period the notification was short, being only at midnight before the auto, but this, as we shall see hereafter, was subsequently extended to three days. In the medieval inquisition, the inquisitor, when rendering sentence, always reserved the right to modify it, in the direction either of mercy or of severity, or to remove it wholly. He could do this, for he was practically independent and irresponsible to any superior, the only authority over him being the distant and most inaccessible Holy See. The Spanish Inquisitor occupied a wholly different position, being held in strict and constantly increasing subordination to the Suprema, and, as commutations early became a source of large revenue, it is easy to understand that the tribunals were not permitted to participate in the proceeds. Already in 1498, the instructions thus undertook to limit the power of inquisitors to modify sentences, by ordering that they should not grant commutations for money, or favor, or without just cause, and, when such existed, the commutation must be into fasts, almsgiving, and other pious uses. There could be no release from wearing the San Benito, and the rehabilitation of descendants was reserved for the Inquisitor General. It was difficult to enforce restrictions which recognized any right of inquisitors to modify sentences, and in 1513 Jimenez deprived them of it wholly and concentrated the power in the hands of the Inquisitor General. It was wholly a matter of finance, and we have seen, Book 5, Chapter 3, how it was henceforth utilized. The tribunal was recognized to have no power to modify a sentence when once pronounced, as an experienced writer says, although by common law inquisitors and ordinaries can change or mitigate sentences, it is otherwise under the instructions which declare that this is reserved for the inquisitor general, the reason being that they have exhausted their powers. In the Indies, where distance rendered application to the Suprema virtually impossible, the tribunals seem to have retained the power of modifying sentences, 
even though they may rarely have exercised it. In 1663, an old woman, known as Isabel de Montoya, tried for sorcery in Mexico, was sentenced to appear in an auto de fe with the San Benito, to receive two hundred lashes, and to serve for life in a hospital. In the audience chamber, November 5th, the sentence was read to her, in presence of the fiscal and her advocate. With the assent of the latter, she begged that the San Benito and the scourging be omitted. She had only been an impostor, and had had no pact, expressed or implied, with the demon, and in view of her age and sickness and crippling in the torture, she supplicated mercy. On November 7th, the fiscal replied to this, asking an aggravation of punishment because it proved her to be an impenitent in denying her pact and intention. November 21st, the consulta de fe assembled and unanimously confirmed its former sentence. The auto de fe was not celebrated until May 4, 1664. On the 6th, she was duly scourged through the streets, and on the 15th, she was delivered to the Hospital del Amor de Dios. Her pitiful prayer, urging age and sickness, was justified, for on June 17th, a messenger from the hospital announced her death, and the inquisitors briefly ordered it to bury her. End of section 12